All right, we finished up our notes on Philip, Bartholomew, and Thomas, and Matthew. Finished up Matthew last week, and so we are towards the end of our study on the apostles, uh, but we do have a few, a few left after this. Uh, but for our, uh, this new set of notes, and as we mentioned, uh, I did email those out, and those are, these are on the table as well. We've got Simon the Zealot, Judas of James, Matthias, and Judas Iscariot in this grouping. And uh, I know it's not quite in order, uh, but there's a reason we're saving the James for the last. Uh, and then also we'll talk about Paul a little bit as well. Uh, but so we'll, we'll talk about Simon the Zealot and Judas of James, I think, this evening. Oh, I think we'll have enough time to be able to cover both of those. And then we'll cover Matthias and Judas next week. Uh, that'll be the, be the plan. If we have time, we'll keep on going. But uh, hopefully we'll get through at least Simon and Judas. All right. So Simon, uh, Simon, also known as Simon the Zealot or Simon Zelotes. Uh, Zelotes is the actual Greek term that is there with the name Simon. That's why it's, it's translated, though, Simon the Zealot, because the lotus literally means zealous. Uh, but what's interesting is, is that in Luke chapter 6 and Acts chapter 1, he's referred to as Simon the Zealot, whereas in Matthew and in Mark, he's referenced as Simon the Canaanite, not Canaanite. Canaan is spelled with three A's. The Canaanite uh, would suggest that this individual was from Cana, not Cana. Uh, Cana, uh, and uh, do you remember a wedding, or do you remember a miracle that took place in Cana? No, no. <laughs> there was a wedding there, and Jesus turned the water to wine there, and that was that that took place in Cana. Some people pronounce it Cana; it's fine either way. Uh, but it this is not the same as Canaan. Uh, again, that's C-A-N-A-A-N is how you spell Canaan, and this is Cana or Cana. Uh, but he's referred to as Simon the Zealot and Simon the Canaanite. However, while this has led some to think he was from the city of Cana, the term used is a der derivation of a Hebrew word meaning zealous. Uh, and what's interesting about that is that the, the term that is used between Matthew and Mark uh, has a Hebrew root, whereas the term in Luke and Acts has the Greek root, both meaning zealous. And so I think it's, uh, it, it, it's, 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 it's interesting because there's a, like a different word that is used to reference Cana or Canite uh, as opposed to someone who is zealous. And typically the, the, this term is used to describe someone who is zealous. However, uh, what's unknown is whether or not the ascription of the zealous or the zealot one is a noun or a adjective. Okay, if it's an adjective, we're describing somebody who is religious, who's zealous, who's uh, fervent in their service to God. You might even use the word devout there. Uh, and so it's unknown whether it's simply describing Simon as being zealous. I personally don't think that's the case, simply because, I mean, remember what we talked about with Bartholomew slash Nathaniel? Okay, remember what Jesus told Nathaniel and John? What did, what did he say about Nathaniel? Here's an Israelite in whom is no what? Guile or deceit. Okay, uh, and, and I think that if you would think that no one individual would necessarily have this adjective ascribed to them as being particularly zealous or overzealous or anything like compared to the rest of them, I wouldn't think. Uh, and that's why generally it's translated as the zealot with a capital Z. Uh, and the reason for that is that the zealots were actually a fourth political faction uh, in the, the, Judean, in, in the uh, Judean society. You had the Pharisees, you had the Sadducees, we're most familiar with those two. Then you had the Essenes, they're the ones who generally were the ones who, who kind of kept and preserved a lot of the Dead Sea Scrolls and so forth. Uh, the Essenes were kind of more, um, a lot of them were scribes and so forth. And then you had this particular, the Zealots. Uh, now the Zealots were of the four, the more, I want to say radical of the four, but they were the most violent of the four. Uh, 
they wanted to kick Rome out and they didn't want to just win it by democracy or win it by convincing them to leave. They wanted to fight with violence and force Rome out of the land of Judea. And so the Zealots were a more of a violent uh, kind of rebel type of sect of the Jews. Uh, and it was founded by Judas of Galilee, which is kind of interesting because Judas of Galilee is mentioned in the Bible uh, in Acts chapter 5 when Gamaliel is speaking great wisdom among the Sanhedrin after they've arrested all the apostles at this point. Remember, it was just Peter and John back in chapter 4. Here in chapter 5, it's all of the apostles. And Gamaliel basically stands up, you need to be careful about what you're doing. And so he mentions in verse six, uh, 36, he mentions Thetis or Thutis. Uh, he rose up. There was 400 who joined him. He died. They were scattered. And then in verse 37, after this man, Judas of Galilee, rose up in the days of the census and drew away many people after him. He also perished and all who obeyed him were dispersed. Uh, and most commentaries connect these two men as being the same person that we're talking about the founder or the originator of the zealots as being the one who is being mentioned here. And what Gamaliel says is that when Gamaliel died in verse 37, those who obeyed him were dispersed. Uh, the, the main individuals who were involved, the main activists, I guess you could say, but the, the group who still believed in the need to, to take up arms and fight against Rome still existed but it wasn't nearly as organized as it had been. Uh, and so, but the, the organization, the, the philosophy, or however you want to say that, that sect still existed. It just didn't have as much organization. And that's what Gamaliel is addressing here. Whereas the apostles, they represented the organization, if you will, of the teaching of the gospel. Okay, and what Gamaliel warns about here is that, hey, if this is of man, it's not gonna, it's not gonna amount to anything. Just as happened with Judas and as happened with Thetis or Thutis, uh, it's not going to come to anything. But if this is of God, you're not going to be able to stop it and you'll find yourself fighting against God. Uh, and so I think that's kind of an interesting situation. And it does also speak to, I don't want to say representation, but the fact that Jesus was not, uh, he didn't draw in terms of the, the men he called as his apostles, he didn't draw them from all one sect of the Jews. Okay, he drew from the Pharisees, certainly Paul was one of the Pharisees, whether or not the others were or not, we don't know exactly where the others landed in terms of which kind of sect they, they aligned themselves with. Generally speaking, and this, this is not said about Matthew, but generally those Jews who took up positions of influence and authority in the Roman government of Judea were typically Sadducees, uh, but that's not, I mean, Matthew's never said to have been a Sadducee, but it would make sense that when Jesus called his apostles, he would call them from all the different corners that represented Jewish society. Uh, and so I, I think it's interesting that it's very possible that when we're talking about Simon the Zealot, uh, that he was actually one of the members of that particular political group, if you will, uh, and obviously was converted because that, that, that wasn't his... That didn't remain his belief or thought process after being taught by Jesus. Uh, legend says that he was executed in 65 AD in Beirut of Syria by an axe. Uh, but what's, what's interesting about Simon is that's it. That's all we have about him. It's just the, the dimensions being in the list, list of, of the apostles uh, and the fact that you've got Simon the Zealot attached to that. That really is all we have in terms of biblical record regarding Simon. Lots of comments on that. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's a great point. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know that, yeah, you know, that, and, and, and that it really is interesting because given the fact, you know, we always think of the apostles as being united and all one, and I'm sure they were, especially after Acts chapter 1. 
eventually, you know. But in terms of those, during those three years, especially maybe at the beginning, there may have been some butting of heads, you know, especially as it pertained to the prophecies and how are the prophecies to be fulfilled, whereas, you know, the Pharisees believed in the Messiah. They all kind of saw or thought of the Messiah as to, was to be a warrior king, uh, but the, the zealots were more proactive in that, I guess you could say. Uh, they, were, they weren't willing to really wait <laughs> for the Messiah to come to do that. They were going to take up arms and be, be fighting when the Messiah showed up. Uh, but yeah, it is interesting that you had, and then of course you had the Sadducees who were, generally speaking, the collaborators with Rome. Uh, and that wasn't always true, and it, it's not true in terms of across the board either. But generally speaking, the Sadducees were the ones that worked better or worked more with the Roman government the Pharisees and so forth, and you had the, the Essenes, and of course we don't know if maybe one of the apostles, I'm sure they probably were, was one of the Essenes as well. Yeah. Oh yeah, you're right. Gideon, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and kind of in Acts 5 is an interesting scenario because you have, in essence, and even the, the Sanhedrin recognize kind of this ragtag group of uneducated men. OK, and they're speaking and saying these things with conviction that they're that they're doing and so forth. And so it, it, it is interesting that you have this uh, wide uh, array of backgrounds of individuals that Jesus called to be apostles and that out of that came these, well, 12 men, ultimately with Matthias, uh, but these, these men who were united together in purpose and ultimately, again, presumably aside from John, all were willing to die for the conviction in Christ Jesus. They all had that same, and that's what the gospel created in them. Not to say that they weren't good, good men or whatnot, but the gospel created in them this united understanding, this united purpose uh, this united conviction that led them to be willing to die. Anything else through that? All right. Is there anything about Simon, and there really, really isn't uh, specific, but is there anything about Simon that we could draw or take away as a, um, uh, as a lesson or application for us? Paul calls himself a violent man. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and you know, I think that that uh, if if we can draw anything from that, the sense of being willing and humble enough to change your view on something that you were taught wrong or believed wrong on and willing to change your character. I mean, just as you mentioned with Paul, Paul had to be humble and recognize that what he'd been doing this whole time when he thought he was fully convicted in what he did, in fact, he was doing everything that was wrong. He was persecuting the church instead of uh, helping the law of Moses or, or, or supporting the law as he viewed as the law of God. Uh, and again, with uh, and, and, and again, I tend to think that this term, the zealot, is referencing that political faction. Uh, but regardless, the fact that even all of these men really had to submit and humble themselves, be willing to be taught and let the gospel change them. And of course, we, you know, we talk all the time about the power of the gospel and what it can do. Uh, in fact, Paul refers to the, the weapons of our warfare, how they are mighty in God for bringing down strongholds of the mind and of the heart, uh, to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. That's what the gospel is capable of doing. Uh, and certainly, assuming Simon was a part of this group, uh, I think that you would have that same, uh, that, that certainly that being shown in what, what the word of Jesus was able to do for Simon. Anything else? Anything else? 
All right, let's move on to Judas. Or Judas to Judas. Uh, Judas actually has potentially four different names that he's known by. Judas, he's called Judas of James in two, on two different occasions. Uh, also known as Thaddeus, known as Labaius, and possibly known as Jude, the writer of the epistle of Jude. Uh, so, we see in Matthew chapter 3 and in verse 18, he's car, uh, Mark, sorry, Mark chapter 3, verse 18, he, he's called Thaddeus. And then in Matthew chapter 10 and in verse 3, in that list, Matthew uh, even goes so far as to tell us that this is Thaddeus, also known as Labaius. Okay, well, so we have Thaddeus, we have Labaius. And when you put these lists up side by side and you start you know, connecting, okay, who's being referred to by the same name, who may have a slightly different name or known by their Roman or Jewish name, vice versa. Then we have in the lists of Luke 6 and Acts 1, what's the common thread between Luke 6 and Acts 1? The author. Who was the author? Luke. So Luke, him, the, the, Luke as the apostle refers to Judas of James on two different occasions in Luke 6 and in Acts 1. So we've got Matthew, Mark, and Luke all referring to this individual. Uh, and when you look at Judas, sometimes it says son of James. The, the, the phrase there actually, there is no son. Okay, it's not son or brother. There's, just, there's no term there in the Greek. It's just Judas of James. Generally speaking, Okay, when that type of attribute is referred to, or, or the, 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 that phrase is used, Judas of James, the inference is that, okay, we're talking about Judas who was born of James. So that means that he's James's son. That's why our translations, usually it's italicized in your Bibles. It'll say uh, Judas and then italicized son of James. Okay, and I point that out because of something that we're going to talk about later on. Uh, but it, it is interesting because when you start comparing Thaddeus Labaius and then cross-referencing these lists, okay, it sounds like when we talk about Thaddeus and Labaius, we're talking about Judas, son of James. The reasoning behind why he's referred to by Mark and Matthew as Thaddeus and or Labaius is debated. However, <laughs> It's interesting because a whole lot of scholars have suggested that Mark and Matthew both wanted to make sure it was understood that the Judas they are talking about is not Judas Iscariot. And I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, maybe that, in fact, it was, it was also suggested, as we've seen, like Peter was a nickname. We know Peter as Peter. We don't know him as Simon. We know him as Peter. But the term Cephas was a nickname given to him by Jesus, and then Cephas translated as Peter, or Petra. Uh, and so it's possible, and some even suggested that maybe Judas was given a nickname by Jesus, or after Judas Iscariot betrayed Jesus, maybe the apostles gave him that nickname, Labaius or Thaddeus, and as a result, okay, again, you would have a Jewish version of that, and you would have a Greek version of that nickname, just as you have with Peter and Cephas, Okay, so that may be the nickname, just like Peter and Cephas, of Judas. But that maybe they referred to him that way because they didn't like saying the name Judas anymore. And so they referred to him as Thaddeus or Labaius. Uh, and that's possible. Judas was a very common name in uh, Judea. So it's not like they would ever have come across another Judas. In fact, there are other Judases mentioned in the New Testament uh, that have no relation to the apost either one of the apostles. Um, and so it's not like Judas, they were going to escape the name at any point, but it, it is interesting. Uh, and then the same thing for Jude as well, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, but that to kind of differentiate between Judas Iscariot and the other Judas, instead they called him Jude. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the thought process regarding Jude, it's interesting because only in English is Jude called Jude. In non-English Bibles, guess what Jude's name is? Judas. <laughs> so I, I, you, know, you never thought, think about you know, hearing the epistle of Judas. You think, oh, that's one of those you know, off-the-wall Gnostic type of letters or whatnot. 
but in non-speaking non-English Bibles, uh, that's it's actually titled Judas because it's the same term. But the English version titled it Jude, and the thought behind that is again to distinguish between the betrayer versus the good one. I guess you could say uh, the good Jude, uh, and so that that might be a similar type of situation as well. Thoughts or comments through that right now? Yes, sir. Yep. Um, well, what's interesting about the letter of Jude, in fact, we'll go ahead and mention this. He's generally considered to be the author of Jude. Most non-English have it as Jude versus Judas. Um, but the, uh, the reference to the brother of James and not son of, whereas the references in Luke and Acts can be interpreted as brother of. However, it's also possible that both were true, that he was both the son of a James and also had a brother named James. Because there was actually uh, James, the son of Alphaeus, okay? And that James had a brother named Jude or Judas. And that is the wife of Ma the, uh, the other Mary that's referred to uh, is, would, is considered to be the, the wife of Alphaeus. Uh, and so his thought process is that that's James Alphaeus, the father, who gave birth both to Jude or Judas and James as well. And when you consider the fact that Jesus had brothers, and we'll talk more about this when we start talking about the Jameses and so forth a little bit, it's interesting when you start looking at the names of Jesus' brothers, there's a lot of crossover here between them and the apostles. And we'll talk a little bit about that when we get to that point. But one of Jesus' brothers, do you remember what one of his names was? One of their names was, were? James and Judas and Joseph, okay? Do you know what Joseph is? Joseph. Joseph. Uh, I've never heard that before. I'll have, to, I'll have to double check that. Joseph is often referred to as Joseph because Barnabas was known as Joseph as well. That was his actual name. And in some, it's translated as Joseph. Uh, so I think those are the same thing. Joseph and Joseph are the same. I'll double check it and make sure. Uh, but what's interesting is that Joseph would have had, presuming that those other brothers were born of Joseph, because uh, we talked about that when we talked about Joseph and in, in our character study on him, uh, that he would have had a son with his name. And that was actually very common for basically what we would call juniors. Okay, such and such junior. Uh, that was actually very common at that time. And so either the connection here is that in Luke chapter 6 and Acts 1, when he says Judas of James, that what Luke is actually saying is Judas the brother of James, okay, which is entirely possible because Luke's not the only one where that happens. Okay, there are other times when somebody's referencing somebody and they say so-and-so of so-and-so, and you can cross-reference and see we're talking about the brother of or the son of, okay? And so a lot of times context and cross-reference helps us to understand which one we're talking about. But regardless, it's very possible both were true, <laughs> that he was both the son of James and the brother of James. It's also possible that the Judas that is be Judas the uh, same as uh, Thaddeus and Labaius, it's possible that he is not the same as the Jude who wrote the epistle. However, that brings up a whole nother question of well, which Jude is that? Uh, and I, I tend to think personally that we are talking about one and the same person, but it's possible that it's not. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, 
Jude could very easily have just been referring to himself in the third person with the rest of them. You know, now normally people like Paul would say us, okay? And a lot of times they did. Yeah, a lot of times they did. Of course, well, and, and like you said, it's very possible that this Jude uh, who wrote the epistle, he might very well be the other Judas we read about later in the New Testament, later on in uh, the book of Acts. It could be that one. Uh, but I, 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 you can go either way on that. It doesn't really make any difference in terms of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It's just trying to make sense of the different Judes and Judases and so forth is, is kind of hard to keep track of. Nolan? Joshua and Jesus. Yeah, Yeshua, yeah. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, so we see the, 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 you know, there's, but there are several uh, references to the, the prospect. In fact, there were some, I don't, I don't know if I included in the notes here or not, uh, that uh, there were some early, and again, some of these early writers, we've talked about that in our, kind of our church history type of discussion a couple of years back, uh, but when we talked about some of that stuff, we noted how there were some things that some of these writers or historians that they wrote in the two and three hundreds and four hundreds, some of those things may very well have been accurate. Some of those things weren't accurate to the scriptures, uh, but there were a couple of them that, that say that Jude, that he was the apostle. How they would know that for sure, unless it had been passed down unto that point, that that was of the apostle Jude, you know, it, again, it's not worth splitting hairs over. Obviously, there was a Judas who wrote the Gospel of Judas or Jude, uh, and he was either a brother or son of James. Uh, so, um, any any thoughts on that? Once again, interestingly, John is the only one, aside from the lists of the apostles in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Acts. Uh, to record anything else about one of the apostles. Remember, he did this with a whole bunch of the others, uh, except for Simon the Zealot. John didn't record anything specific about Simon the Zealot. Uh, but he did record in John 14, and in verse 22, he records something about, um, about uh, Labaius or Judas. And what's interesting here is this is the same context that we looked at regarding both Philip and Thomas. And remember, they're having a hard time understanding kind of the spiritual nature of the things Jesus is talking about. Thomas says, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Philip says, Lord, show us the Father. It's sufficient for us, suggesting that Philip also doesn't quite understand what's happening. But if you just show us the Father, we're good to go. Jesus says, you've been with me this long. You don't know that you've seen the Father through me, basically. And in this, it's in the same context of discussion, the same teaching of Jesus that starting in verse 22, John says Judas, and then he's very careful to make the case, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? So again, this is one just in the middle of nowhere, John doesn't expand anymore on anything about Judas other than this question. But it does show a continuation of this struggle that they had to understand what Jesus was talking about. And to that end, verse 19, he said, Jesus, as, as Jesus is talking to the apostles, says, a little longer, the world will see me no more. But you will see me because I live, you will live also. At that day, you will know me or at that day, you will know that I am in my father and you in me and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Okay, so Jesus has said this, just like as he says, you know, uh, I'm going away, and if I'm going away to prepare a place for you, I'll come back. And, you know, the way you know, and so forth, as he says earlier uh, in chapter 14, and then he talks about the, the way, the truth, and life also at, um, elsewhere in chapter 15. But here in verse 14, Judas, not Iscariot, says, Lord, how will you manifest yourself to us, but not to the world? And I can understand why Judas was confused. 
Judas's thought process is, well, you, you manifest yourself to us. We will see you and believe in you. Why not show yourself to the rest of the world? Why not manifest yourself to everybody so that they will believe? And Jesus, in verse 23, answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Now, the important aspect to this is that Jesus, it's slightly different wording, but it's basically what he's already said in verse 21, except Jesus is focusing on the individual, the individual hearing the word of God, choosing to obey. In fact, that's what the, the keep my word, uh, keep, you know, keep keeping the commandments of the Lord, obeying then does what? If we love Jesus and we obey his word, what does Jesus say is going to happen? What does that create? Okay. Another way we would say that is fellowship with the Father. Just as John in 1 John chapter 1 describes what spiritual fellowship is all about, is walking in the light as he is in the light. Well, Jesus describes those who are going to choose to obey. He says, if anyone loves me. But what's interesting is I think Judas is asking this question, manifesting yourself kind of abroad to everybody all at once. Okay, multitude type of thing. And he doesn't understand that what Jesus is describing, what he's teaching them, has to do with the spiritual relationship that exists in the heart and the spirit of the believer when they obey God's word, do what he says. That's why in verse 21, it is he who loves me who keeps those commandments. He who loves me will be loved by my father. So if you keep my commandments, the father's going to love you. And of course, we know from a, a broad perspective, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. But what Jesus is referencing here is that love of fellowship uh, in, in being kind of connected together. I will love him and manifest myself to him. But Judas is thinking physically. That's his thought process. He's thinking physically manifest himself to us. As opposed to what Jesus describes is to each individual spiritually. It's in the heart and in the mind of individuals when they obey God's word. Jesus and his character is made manifest. Not that Jesus will all of a sudden appear in front of me and talk to me. Okay, And that's what Judas, I think, was thinking in verse 22. Lord, how is it that you'll manifest yourself to us, not to the world? You're going to show up to us, but if you show up to everybody else, they would believe. So why, why won't you do that? Well, the only people to whom Jesus will be made manifest are those who believe God's word. The only people, the only way that's going to happen is through God's word, through the obedience to God's word. And that, thus that relationship that then exists when obeying God's word. So, again, the same exact issue that took place, and, and it wasn't just these, all the apostles struggled with this. But uh, Philip and uh, Thomas and Judas all asked questions that didn't fully understand what Jesus was saying. There was that physical versus spiritual issue that they were struggling with. Thoughts or comments through that? Okay. Um, as we mentioned, if this is the same man, he would refer to himself as the brother of James, not son of, while the references to Luke and Acts can be interpreted as brother of. Uh, I think, again, the, 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 the phrase or the term in um, Jude is brother of. Some have tried to kind of loosely interpret that term to say relative of, but Adelphos almost always is used translated as brother. Uh, Adelphos can mean kin or cousin, but it's almost always translated as brother. Uh, and so I would hesitate to go on that limb and say, yeah, but in Jude, he's really saying, I'm the relative of James. Well, that doesn't really make a lot of sense. Son and brother are two different terms. But in, uh, as I said in 
uh, by, by Luke, when he refers to Judas of James, it may be very possible that the ones to whom he was writing were well aware of the relationship that existed between Judas and James, and so they understood we're talking about Judas, the brother of James. So maybe Luke just felt he didn't have to specify the brother of, just Judas of James. It's possible. Okay. Could be that both are true. Uh, in the sense that, again, Father James, brother is also James, uh, and it's also possible that Jude was written by another Judas. Not Judas Iscariot, but another Judas. I, I, I hope I didn't confuse people with that. I, I understand. It, and it, it is confusing when you start going through and you start looking at all these names, and you're trying to, sometimes you get cross-eyed trying to figure out who's who. Uh, but I, I hope that that makes a little bit of sense. All right, anything else on? Okay, I accidentally kept the thing. No, 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 yeah, okay. The no, legend says that Jude was executed in uh, 65 AD in Beirut along with Simon's Lotus. That's right. Uh, I couldn't find anything on Simon, uh, or on uh, Simon specifically, uh, on Simon the Zealot, in terms of legend, you know, in terms of how he died or whatnot. It wasn't until I started researching stuff on uh, Jude that I came across the reference to uh, it is, it's widely passed along or whatever legend that Jude and Simon were killed together in Beirut. Uh, and I thought that was kind of interesting. That would be the only ones that I know of who were killed at the same time together like that, if, that's, if that actually happened. Any thoughts through uh, Jude? Good. Yeah, it could point to these Simon and Jude being brothers. Yep, sure could. Anything else? Both of them have enough faith and jealousy that at least according to the second word, word there, they're put to death. Well, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, in, you know, and so in, in describing Jude, obviously um, the fact that they both had the conviction the willingness, and certainly, and we believe and understand that, that all the apostles certainly were willing to die, okay? Whether or not they were actually put to death in Syria or not, they certainly were all willing to die. And the fact that both Simon and uh, Jude, if indeed they were together, um, that certainly would speak to their conviction and, and maybe even taking courage together in standing for the truth uh, in, the face of, in the face of people who were trying to kill them. And so that's, that's an interesting point. What's one more thing we get, though, from, especially from John 14, verse 22? What's another characteristic or, or something we should seek to emulate that we see about uh, Jude or Judas? Yeah, yeah. You know, we, we noted with Philip and with uh, Thomas that they wanted to know, okay? They, they wanted to know, but their statements weren't really questions. I mean, they were, but, you know, Thomas was like, we don't know where you're going, so we don't know how to get there. Philip was like, well, show us the Father, and, you know, we don't understand what you're saying, but that'll be enough. But then Judas actually asks the question, well, okay, you said you're going to manifest yourself to us, but why don't you manifest yourself to everybody? You know, he wanted to understand. He wanted to know. And I would say the rest of the apostles did, too. They wanted to understand. It wasn't a lack of interest. They wanted to know, and they were willing to ask questions. But then Jesus says, it's not just to you I'm going to make myself manifest, to anyone who obeys my words. Okay, It's not just you that I'm going to manifest myself to, but it's not manifest literally. It's through the gospel and, and through his character and found in the gospel. All right, we will stop there. We will pick up with Matthias and with... Um, Judas Iscariot next week. Matthias won't take long. There's not a lot about Matthias listed other than in Acts chapter 1. Judas Iscariot, however, there's quite a bit to consider and look at regarding him. Uh, so I imagine he will take most of the, the rest of the class next week. And then after that, we will go back and look at some of the Jameses that we're, we've been talking about a little bit um, and try to connect some of these dots together with all these names that are the same. Are they the same people? That sort of thing. Thank you, everybody.